formal start. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, colleagues and friends, uh, welcome. Um, welcome to this, <laughs> depending on uh, where you currently are, early morning, midday, um, or uh, evening webinar. A webinar on the 2023 US uh, Taiwan Trade Agreement and the ongoing trade negotiations between the United States and Taiwan. My name is Peter van den Bosse, and I'm Director of Studies of the World Trade Institute in Bern, the organizer of this webinar. The relations between the United States and Taiwan have always been of great economic and political importance to both countries. But against the background of the geopolitical and the economic confrontation between the United States and China, these relations have in recent years uh, become even more important. At least that's my perception. And the importance given to these negotiations is well reflected um, in the US-Taiwan initiative on 21st century trade, which was launched in 2000. And 2022, June 2022, and which already resulted in, 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 in an agreement uh, one year later, in June 2023. It's exactly the agreement that is uh, the topic of our conference today. Um, an agreement, a first agreement, that is dealing with matters as diverse as customs administration and facilitation. Um, uh, good regulatory practices, uh, services, domestic regulation, anti-corruption and trade by small and medium-sized enterprises. Currently, a second round of negotiations are ongoing on the particularly challenging, if I can say that, um, challenging issues of trade and agriculture, labor, and the environment. To discuss the economic and political significance of the 2023 trade agreement and the ongoing negotiations, um, we're very honored uh, and feel very fortunate that Minister Don Deng has agreed to participate in this um, webinar. Uh, Minister Deng is Minister with our portfolio of the government of Taiwan and is Taiwan's chief trade representative position that he has held since 2016. As chief trade representative, he oversees all aspects of Taiwan's trade policy, as well as negotiations with trading partners around the world. Prior to his appointment um, uh, as a chief a trade representative, Minister Deng held various high-level positions uh, within the government, um, and he was a more of um, Minister of Economic Affairs and Deputy Secretary General of the National Security Council. Minister Deng will be the first speaker at this webinar, after which we will hear from the other panelists, their views on the economic and political importance of the 2023 trade agreements and the ongoing negotiations in these times of, and I already referred to it, geopolitical and geoeconomic confrontation. I'm very pleased uh, that Kathleen Clausen, Shang Fa Lo, and Jeffrey Scott have accepted the WTI's invitation to participate in this webinar. Jeffrey Scholl, uh, is a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute uh, for International Economics in Washington, D.C. And he has been working, is working uh, on international trade policy and economic sanctions. He has taught at Princeton University and Georgetown University and has previously served as a U.S. government official and trade negotiator. Kathleen Clausen is professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center and co-editor-in-chief of the Journal of International Economic Law. Prior to joining academia, 
um, Kathleen Clawson was the Associate General Counsel at USTR. Jacques Fallot, our third uh, speaker uh, after Minister Day. Jacques Fallot um, is the permanent representative um, of Chinese Taipei to the WTO. Prior to his appointment in Geneva, um, Shang Falo was uh, a justice of the institution of the Constitutional Court of Taiwan, and before that, uh, dean of the College of Law of Taiwan National University. After Minister Deng's presentation, Shang Falo will speak first, followed by Kathleen Clausen and then Jeffrey Schott. Uh, subsequently. I will give each of the panelists an opportunity to react to statements made by the other panelists, and then we welcome questions uh, from the online global audience. And I invite the online uh, audience um, to uh, use the uh, Q&A function and not the chat function uh, for asking questions to the panelists. And now, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Minister Day. Minister Day, please. Uh, thank you very much, Professor uh, Van der Bush. And uh, I'll say hello to uh, Ambassador Law and Professor uh, Catherine uh, Clausen and uh, uh, Professor Scott, uh, Jeffrey Scott. Uh, I always, we are friends for, for a long time. so. I used to call him uh, Jeffrey. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the uh, participants of this seminar around the, uh, around the wo world. So just like uh, follow you, uh, good morning to someone, good afternoon to someone, and good evening to someone. Uh, I, uh, 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 I, I appreciate uh, the uh, WTI organized this uh, occasion. Uh, so that I can present uh, Taiwan's view on this uh, recently signed uh, U.S.-Taiwan uh, trade agreement. Uh, very quickly, I'll brief to you uh, what is Taiwan. Sometimes uh, Taiwan, uh, I know in recent years, Taiwan now appears uh, quite often on the international uh, media. Uh, but... Uh, uh, to give you a, uh, give the uh, audience uh, some ideas about Taiwan, I'll give you, I'll use some numbers. Uh, Taiwan's GDP in total is about uh, 752 billion US dollars, the 22nd largest in the world. Uh, our population relatively is small, 23 million. Uh, on the per capita GDP, uh, if we use purchasing power, uh, we, our per capita GDP is about 72,000 US dollar, the uh, 15th uh, largest in the, uh, in the uh, number 15th in the world. On trade, uh, Taiwan is the seventh largest, both in the world, both in import and export. Uh, the number is, uh, on our export is about uh, 480 billion. Import is about 440 billion. So this is a quite balanced, healthy uh, trade, uh, both uh, import and export. Uh, Taiwan is an outward, out, outward uh, investor uh, investing country. Our investment, uh, our war investment uh, in 2023 is 26.6 billion US dollar. United States is the largest destination of our foreign investment. Uh, occupy pretty much 37% uh, of our uh, outward investment go to United States. Uh, and uh, uh, Europe is the second 
largest for our destination than Southeast Asia. This is very, uh, very different from previous years. In previous years, it, it was China is the largest uh, destination of our investment. But in recent years, it's changed, now become the United States. The, the most famous, no, largest case of our investment to United States is TSMC, uh, which is the 14 billion uh, project uh, in Arizona to produce semiconductor. <laughs> our in-world investment, mainly uh, from United States, from Europe, uh, Europe is the largest source of our uh, foreign investment. Uh, now, uh, on the, uh, on the manufacturer side, on the industry side, Taiwan is very small on agriculture, very large on manufacture. Uh, on manufacturer side, the largest sector is semiconductor uh, and the electronic sector. Uh, on the semiconductor, the United States is the largest semiconductor producer in the world. Taiwan is the second. But in terms of the advanced manufacture of the semiconductor, Taiwan produced close to 70 to 80% of the world production of advanced semiconductor is manufactured in Taiwan. So uh, I, I don't want to use another more numbers, but this is the, this is the numbers I, uh, I want uh, your audience to, uh, to know uh, about Taiwan. So, uh, this is, we, we call ourselves a, a mid-size, uh, yeah. mid-size uh, economy. Now, uh, coming to our topic, why trade agreement are important to Taiwan? Uh, China, uh, China's expiration for global dominance and uh, aggression towards Taiwan pose a threat to the uh, world economy and uh, pose also geopolitical political risk. Uh, given Taiwan's strategic importance in the Indo-Pacific region and uh, the crucial role in the regional supply chain, maintaining uh, stability in the Taiwan Strait is widely considered a matter of global interest. Uh, in addition to uh, political support, such stability requires ensuring that Taiwan possess strong economic strength and is able to better integrate it to the uh, international trade regime. Uh, with trade across Taiwan's trade growing rapidly in past 20 years, uh, Beijing initially uh, sought to increase Taiwan's economic dependence on China. In the highest record, we export 44% of our products to China. Uh, in recent years, however, this dependence has allowed China to exercise coercive practice in an effort to damage Taiwan's industry and Taiwan's farmers and to manipulate Taiwan's public opinion. Uh, we recently had our presidential election, uh, which we can see very clearly uh, the uh, misinformation uh, campaign was, uh, was quite intense and uh, the source uh, of course, it's coming from uh, China. China also attempt to leverage its market advantage to isolate Taiwan uh, by pressing other countries not to engage in uh, official relation with Taiwan, including not to sign trade agreements uh, with us. Therefore, the government's efforts is 
to diversify our market uh, out from China. So in, in addition to uh, diversifying our market, Taiwan has been actively seeking to negotiate trade and investment agreement with like-minded partners. Uh, to developing a, a network of uh, free trade agreement can help Taiwan to provide a buffer uh, against China's economic coercion while mitigating the risk associated with Taiwan's over-reliance on Chinese market. Uh, this will also establish a solid institutional framework for trade relations, uh, allowing Taiwan to overcome its political isolation and ensure its economic security. Uh, while we, uh, we, we all always uh, appreciate very much that the international community uh, always show their support uh, to Taiwan. However, on the uh, trade uh, integration part, uh, the opinion here in, in, in Taiwan is that uh, uh, we are quite uh, isolated. We do not have uh, many trade agreement uh, with our trade partners. Uh, we only, so far, we have a trade agreement with our diplomatic allies, which the number is very small, and with Singapore and New Zealand. The, 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 uh, we treasure uh, this, those trade agreements, but adding all up the volume uh, that the trade coverage uh, of, of under the uh, free trade agreement is relatively uh, small. Uh, now, uh, let me very uh, uh, let's come to this 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 part that an overview of the U.S. Taiwan initiative on twenty first century uh, trade agreement. The U.S. Taiwan initiative uh, uh, was commenced uh, against the backdrop drop of uh, a uh, geopolitical change reflecting renewed concerns over supply chain disruptions, uh, unfair competition, and abusive subsidies uh, in recent years uh, from China. Uh, in this respect, the initiative re represents an attempt on the part of the United States and Taiwan to jointly address those concerns. Uh, this effort also embodies an efforts to uh, promote the share value of the two countries, including uh, our commitments to democracy, freedom, inclusivity, and the uh, rule-based trading system. Uh, yet, uh, these negotiations would not have been possible had Taiwan not been willing to tackle some of the uh, trade irritants, uh, particularly with respect to import restrictions on US pork with recumbent. Probably this is a very difficult uh, name for audience to understand recumbent. Uh, my understanding it is some, some chemicals or hormones that we feed, add into the uh, uh, feed for the uh, hog so that their meat uh, can be uh, more tasty or better. Uh, so uh, that, that is, we, we ban uh, for many years the uh, pork with uh, red common. However, this is a, to the United States, this is a kind of uh, uh, trade barrier. Uh, Trade volume is not large. However, uh, many, of the, uh, 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 many of the people in the United States, government or on the uh, 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 industry, uh, thinks that uh, Taiwan does not follow international uh, standard and add additional requirement 
on the international standard. So uh, our decision to open uh, this market to uh, U.S. pork is following a uh, uh, referendum uh, proposed by opposition. Uh, and uh, since, since this kind of decision is not is quite unpopular in political uh, sense. Uh, the uh, consumers, particular consumer groups, uh, uh, always consider that they want, they don't want uh, particular chemicals uh, on their food. So this is, a, 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 therefore, uh, the opposition party uh, proposed a referendum. Uh, the referendum, including the preparation, uh, debating time from the beginning until the uh, end, uh, the polling result uh, uh, calculated, it took us about one year. Uh, this is a quite a busy year for us uh, to uh, explain to the society that we have to follow international uh, rules. Uh, fortunately, we won that battle uh, so that we can prove uh, Taiwan is capable of adhering to international standards and so that we also garnered widespread support from the uh, US Congress and uh, the uh, administration. The uh, US-Taiwan initiative on uh, this 21st century trade uh, our aim is to establish rules for the promotion of fairness and uh, inclusivity by addressing 12 emerging topics. Uh, the effect of to the trade of these 12 topics we think might be greater than tariff reduction. Uh, this agreement also can provide an opportunity for US and Taiwan to achieve high standards and economically meaningful outcome. In fact, many of the provisions being negotiated under this initiative exceed the standards established under both the WTO and the CPTPP. Uh, it does not include market access. So there is no tariff concession portion on this agreement. Uh, but the first agreement, uh, which we signed in the June, June 1st of 2023, uh, is a solid legal instrument. Uh, this instrument containing preamble, initial provisions, general definitions, exceptions, final provisions. So this is, we consider this is a, a provide a very uh, strong uh, legal foundation for the engagement of uh, between uh, Taiwan and the United States. And then we, uh, uh, we uh, the, why we select these uh, uh, five topics, we consider these five topics are uh, relatively, uh, we have identical system both uh, in the United States and Taiwan. So we, our, we give them a name called low hanging fruits. Uh, that include trade facilitation, good regulatory practice, service, domestic regulations, anti-corruption, and small and medium uh, size enterprises. Uh, after we, uh, during the, this negotiation and after we sign it, it becomes very clear to the public and to our business community that the, uh, this first agreement uh, can uh, streamline the custom procedures to boost the uh, competitiveness of Taiwan products uh, in the US market and vice versa. Of course, uh, this is a reciprocal uh, obligation to each other. Uh, so it also provides a uh, good, uh, better opportunity for US product uh, shipped to Taiwan. And also it's enhancing regulatory transparency and public participation in the regulatory price, uh, process uh, so that 
the public and the, the business community can uh, have plenty of opportunities to participate in the uh, in the regulation of uh, uh, formation of regulation. So their views uh, can be seriously considered uh, into that process. Uh, third, uh, we can uh, work together uh, to combat bribery and corruption. So both government and private sectors are all covered uh, in this uh, topic. And of course, we want a small medium enterprise, women, indigenous people, and other vulnerable groups can also have benefits, can get benefits of trade. Uh, uh, so we also include those elements into a disagreement. Now, we are uh, negotiating currently, since we finished the first agreement, we are now currently engaged in negotiation on agricultural labor and the environment. Uh, this is a, this is a quite, uh, uh, this is not low hanging fruits as we had in previous five. Uh, this is a relatively uh, challenging topics. Uh, we find that uh, uh, this whole process is to harmonize the uh, system between United States and Taiwan. And for instance, in labor, uh, we both put labor uh, in a very high uh, uh, level of protection. Uh, however, the system uh, sometimes is different. So we need uh, quite lengthy time uh, trying to find a way to harmonize these two systems. Uh, environment is relatively uh, easy. Agriculture also is a very sensitive uh, uh, sector. If we can finish these three, then we will move to uh, another four topics, state-owned enterprise, non-market policies, standards, and digital trade. Uh, so uh, the, on the agriculture, of course, we hope that uh, this agreement can help uh, us on the, uh, to provide us better food security and uh, we can encourage more agricultural innovation. And of course, on labor side, we hope to improve labor conditions and empowering workers' participation in the formulation of trade policy. And uh, uh, we want to enhance corporate social responsibility and promote environmental sustainability. Those are all the goals for this uh, currently uh, uh, negotiating three topics. The, I now, I, I want to touch the economic and political implications of this uh, trade agreement. Uh, let's start from economic implications. Uh, in recent years, Taiwan's investment, I, I already mentioned that, uh, Taiwan's investment to United States now is the largest. Uh, and the US also is a very important uh, uh, foreign investment source uh, of Taiwan. So this initiative, initiative uh, is expected to strengthen and expand uh, this investment and trade by establishing a framework for improving economic relation and boosting confidence among business. So the, uh, uh, my personal view is uh, uh, this, after we sign the first agreement, the business community uh, in Taiwan uh, shows they are much more comfortable uh, with government's ability uh, to help them if they move to United States. So this business confidence is very, very noticeable. And the pending negotiations uh, is another, we have a pending negotiations with the United States 
is the avoidance of double taxation agreement. If we have uh, these two agreements, trade agreement as well as avoidance of double taxation agreement, then I think uh, US and Taiwan economic relations can be established in a very strong foundations. Uh, another uh, economic implication uh, is with traditional trade agreement no longer uh, can deliver uh, very uh, 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 tangible benefits. There has also been a focus on addressing these non-tariff barriers to trade. Uh, then, of course, the means is to harmonize the trade policies and regulations. And uh, of course, we need a transparent, inclusive, and the innovative trade rules uh, that, uh, uh, that we can establish uh, under this initiative and also can showcase Taiwan's ability to adhere to international standards as a trustworthy trading partner. On the political implication, uh, this agreement is signed by AIT, TECRO. This needs some explanation. AIT is Thai, uh, American Institute in Taiwan. This is a uh, this is nothing but the U.S. Embassy uh, in Taiwan, but name is American Institute in Taiwan. And TECRO, uh, Taipei Economic and Cultural uh, Representative Office in Washington, D.C. It's also nothing but an embassy. But we have to use this because of the uh, uh, Taiwan Relations Act. So the agreement is signed uh, under these two parties. But, but the agreement is open-ended and its title could also, could not be clear. The official title of this agreement, agreement between AIT and TECRA regarding trade between United States of America and Taiwan. This reference to Taiwan in the title underscores the importance that uh, uh, placed by United States on the agreement, as well as its willingness to engage with Taiwan as a subject of international law. Uh, while uh, 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 Biden administration uh, uh, always have this uh, uh, debate uh, with uh, Congress that uh, uh, they assert that the agreement such as this one uh, for force within the uh, exclusive jurisdiction of the executive branch, the Congress has asserted that the administration of usurping its authority. Uh, fortunately, in our case, this dispute boiled over when the first agreement was signed and then resulting in the passage of uh, U.S.-Taiwan Initiative uh, Implementation Act by both Senate and of House of Representatives. Uh, in the House, it is unanimously. In the Senate, it is 42 versus zero. So the support is very, very clear. The support is bipartisan. Uh, among these uh, uh, other things, this act is fully approved uh, uh, officially approves the first agreement, thereby granting this agreement a very solid uh, legal status uh, while demonstrating strong bipartisan support uh, for Taiwan. Uh, more recently, Taiwan has also completed negotiations over an investment arrangement with Canada and an enhanced trade partnership with United Kingdom. Uh, this is not a coincidence. And as Taiwan continues to uh, cultivate closer ties with other countries, we believe this agreement uh, will serve as a kind of template for encouraging countries uh, to negotiate similar arrangements with Taiwan in the future. Uh, to conclude, uh, although uh, this is not a traditional free trade agreement, uh, 
but the economic and political importance of the U.S.-Taiwan trade agreement should not be underestimated. Economically, it will boost bilateral investment trade uh, and uh, confirming Taiwan's status as a trustworthy trading partner. Politically, it will represent nothing less than a breakthrough in the U.S.-Taiwan in the United States uh, Taiwan policy and has the full approval of the Congress, which uh, we think will can encourage other countries to follow suit. So thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, probably it, I took longer than the time you allocate for me, <laughs> but thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> no, no, not at all. I Thank you. Um, this was most informative, and um, you've seen me also taking notes of things that uh, were new to me. So thank you very, very much. Um, Shanfa, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, uh, for giving me the floor and for having me uh, involved in the uh, in this very uh, meaningful event. Uh, my intervention includes three parts, uh, political imp implication, economic implication, and perhaps some uh, some words about implications for global global trading system. Well, I'm hoping to, to be able to supplement uh, what uh, John, my good friend, my long-term friend, has already so comp uh, comprehensively uh, explained. Uh, of course, with the note that uh, some of my observations have been highlighted by me, Minister Dan, such as the share value uh, in the agreement of coercive uh, practices uh, by Taiwan's neighbor, as well as some economic and political implications. I'll try to avoid repetition to the extent uh, possible. So the first point is of political and ge geopolitical implications. Uh, rising from the conclusion of uh, the 21st century initiative. Well, the initiative was proposed and accepted partly to respond to Taiwan's long time pursuit of Taiwan US uh, FTA and partly to avoid the political difficulty uh, of Taiwan's participation in the uh, in, in IPEF, uh, in the Indo Pacific Economic Framework. And I see the conclusion of this agreement uh, being achievement for Taiwan at the right time with the right person, of course. We have John Den <laughs> being our leading uh, negotiator uh, with the right approach. Uh, the agreement carries, uh, I think, far more than symbolic weight, weight as mentioned by, uh, by Minister Den. <laughs> Uh, the most important implication of uh, the initiative uh, is to signify the bilateral relationship and to reaffirm Taiwan's uh, standing. Although uh, this is not a traditional FTA, as, uh, as John has mentioned, it is still comprehensive enough to demonstrate the level of importance or the level of recognition of the importance of the bilateral uh, relations between Taiwan and the US. Well, as John has mentioned, the importance is further strengthened by the fact that the US Congress approved this agreement. So this shows the, uh, that supporting Taiwan's um, autonomy and democratic value is the consensus in Washington, DC. Well, another uh, important political implication is to reaffirm uh, the commitment, both sides commitment to share values and interests. John then just mentioned uh, what are the share, share values embedded uh, in, the, uh, in this agreement. I, I will not uh, repeat it, but this is of course one aspect uh, that uh, our participants uh, can uh, take note of it. Uh, as also based on the uh, increased, potentially increased bilateral co cooperation between the two countries based on this, uh, this new agreement. Uh, I believe experiences can be accumulated and, and useful experiences can also be extended to wider bi bilateral areas between the two countries. And this of course can help 
uh, enhance the, uh, the the broader cooperation, uh, not merely focusing on on trade and investment, but also others. And of course, this this helps. Uh, there is a, a substantial political importance for broader for for the broader region, uh, because uh, this could be considered as a as a, a factor a factor or or, or a, a, a contributor in the in the geopolitical alignment in, in this area so this could uh maybe has an an, an impact on the uh regional dy dynamic uh in in east asia i uh, i believe uh, this area can be further explored uh, in the in the future and also, I see this agreement as being able to promote stronger economic ties with like-minded countries. Uh, and, and this help Taiwan's uh, position against aggression or coercion from, uh, from its big neighbor. Uh, and, and, and as mentioned by John, since the... Uh, since Taiwan and the U.S. are able to find a way forward to establish their relations through uh, concluding this type of uh, agreement under very difficult political situations, other countries now have a new option, new model uh, to consider to establish similar kind of bilateral initiative with Taiwan uh, for, for, for both sides uh, to work on. So this is political uh, implication. And certainly the economic implications, uh, as reflected in the preamble of the agreement, uh, the purpose of the agreement is uh, to achieve high standards and economically meaningful outcome to support the fair, fairer market. Uh, this, is, this was also uh, highlighted by, by John. Uh, I, I believe this uh, create a more transparent and streamlined regulatory process, which in turn will help contribute to economic opportunities uh, in both markets. And this cannot be quantified immediately, but I, I believe this is uh, very, uh, very meaningful for both uh, for, for businesses uh, in both uh, both countries. And, and, and because of the high uh, substantive standards. This would enhance the quality of trade between uh, two sides, and, and this ensure their, their respective supply chains uh, uh, be be more health being healthy and more more sustainable. So this is about the quality of the uh, trade operation and investment operation. Uh, uh, and, and of course, uh, this is part of Taiwan's efforts in diverse diversifying its. Uh, it's uh, it's trading uh, trading counterpart uh, to reduce a dependence uh, on any single countries, especially uh, 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 China. Well, the last point is about the uh, implication for for the uh, global uh, trading system. Well, I believe this agreement is the first one with comprehensive trade related provisions, but without market access commitment. So an FTA without the core content of FTA. And FTAs uh, typically involve commitment, as mentioned by John, uh, to reduce to, uh, or eliminate tariff or other barriers to trade in goods or services, as provided uh, in GET Article 24 and, and GET Article 5. These provisions uh, requires duties and regulations for commerce are eliminated. Or, or, or services uh, being liberalized uh, to substantial uh, sectoral coverage. So these are the requirements, but the initiative does not include any market uh, commitment or tariff reduction. Therefore, it does not fit the traditional definition of an FTA. Accordingly, of course, uh, parties uh, to this agreement uh, do not need to notify to the agreement uh, uh, to notify the agreement as the Committee on Regional Trade Agreement, the uh, CRTA, for review. But it would be very interesting uh, to see what could happen if the, uh, this agreement is notified to the uh, uh, CRTA. Uh, I believe this uh, could uh, further be, be uh, closely observed. 
Uh, however, uh, definitely trade agreements can take different forms and, and may address a wider range of issues uh, beyond traditional market access issues. So while such agreement might not be classified as FTA in traditional sense, uh, they still have significant implications for trade and economic relations between the participating uh, countries. From the WTO's perspectives, many of the chapters or provisions are partly covered by some WTO agreements, such as uh, trade facilitation agreement, but many other chapters or even uh, provisions are in the uh, trade facilitation uh, part of, of this particular agreement are far beyond the sphere or the scope of the WTO agreement. The parties, uh, both parties, Taiwan and, 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 and the US, have the wide discretion to formulate the content of the agreement without being restricted by the WTO or governed by the non-discrimination requirement under the WTO agreement. And since negotiating for market access and tariff reduction is far more sensitive and difficult for many countries, a comprehensive trade agreement without market access or tariff elimination commitment could be an alternative way to enhance the resilience and quality of their bilateral or regional trade. So this is uh, what uh, John has mentioned, uh, being uh, the, the 21st century uh, initiative, being a, an example uh, for other countries uh, to, to, to consider. So from all this perspective, uh, the approach as well as the content involved in the 21st century trade initiative um, is, uh, is uh, perhaps a, a good uh, precedent uh, for, uh, for people uh, in this field or in the field uh, of other areas uh, to closely observe. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you very, very much, Anva. And uh, we may have a discussion on, um, well, it's not a traditional free trade agreement, but does that mean that it's not a, an agreement that makes trade freer? Um, and therefore, um, anyway, um, <laughs> um, I'll first hear from, uh, from Kathleen. Kathleen, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Peter, and uh, wonderful to be here with you all. Uh, greetings again to Minister Dang and Ambassador Lowe, and of course to to Jeff. Uh, it's great to see you all, and uh, and all of those joining us today. Some good friends out there um, participating in our in our conversation. What a privilege to be a part of this. So I um, I'm going to pick up on some of the threads that have um, been um, already suggested, and, and some. So without trying to to repeat, because of course, Minister Deng and Ambassador Lowe have said quite a bit about what's occurred, but perhaps what I can offer is one DC lawyer's impressions of, of what has transpired. Um, not the authoritative DC lawyer's view, but one who cares a lot about trade agreements and has been watching this process alongside others. And perhaps that's one place to, to begin. That is um, where, and this Ambassador Lowe referred to this, but when this was first announced, it was, as you heard, June 2022, a moment where it seemed that this was a, a parallel to the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework conversations that had all also begun by that at that point, a way to engage with Taiwan uh, alongside this other major Asia Pacific initiative that was underway already from the Biden administration not to leave Taiwan out. Um, and then, of course, a year later, we get this uh, important agreement that you've already heard a lot about about customs uh, facilitation, regulatory practices, anti corruption, uh, small and medium sized enterprises. So um, the, the the moment was um, uh, not lost, so to speak, on those of us who are watching uh, the Biden administration's trade policy. Uh, and then to see something like this with both binding and non-binding provisions um, was an important signal um, and also a sign of um, uh, just exactly how committed uh, the Biden administration was to working with Taiwan, again, in the ways that you've, you've already heard. It was presented to the DC community and I think continues to be, as, as Minister Deng has confirmed in, in various respects, a framework initiative under which we would see several different agreements over time. Um, 
much again like IPEF and and some of the other initiatives are our, our Americas a partnership has taken a similar uh, sort of approach um, but this is not something that we typically have seen right of course everyone uh, who's watching knows that um, uh, FTAs have been the, the the long approach and so this is a sort of a new approach but one that the Biden administration has repeated in many contexts not just with with Taiwan I'll note that um, it, it appears the agreement is not yet in force and so perhaps Minister Deng wishes to speak to that uh, in our in our conversation here shortly as to what remains and, and when we might expect it to come into force. As he highlighted, we're already in the negotiations on the second of the two agreements um, in the framework initiative. Um, one uh, on which the United States has given some hints as to as to content beyond just the topic areas. So. Minister Deng and Ambassador Lowe referred to um, the negotiations ongoing, and of course we got a readout from Taiwan on the sidelines of MC13 um, that they would they would cover um, and they're accelerating discussions on on labor, agriculture, and environment. Uh, USTR has further elaborated, saying that uh, we're going to see the first of its kind provision on environmental justice, and that particularly when looking at labor, they're interested in um, perhaps uh, potential abuses that that may be ongoing in deep water fishing vessels. So, so we have little tidbits of what, what might be coming in the second agreement. But again, uh, for those of us who are sort of watching uh, this uh, on, on the outside uh, and don't have the, the privilege of being in, in the room, these are some of the things that have, have come to light and some of the impressions that I would say that, that we have had and, and, and among, among others. In the remaining time that I have, what I really like to focus on are the sort of domestic legal issues and, and the international legal issues very briefly, but the domestic legal issues that this agreement has uh, presented. Um, and you've again heard a, a little bit about what those might be. Uh, to set the scene for those who, again, are not sort of living and breathing the, the D.C. trade environment, um, we, we find ourselves in a space in which Congress and the executive have uh, experienced somewhat a bit of tension on who decides what U.S. trade policy should be. This is the result of our constitutional structure that the US Constitution provides that it's Congress that has the prerogative to regulate commerce with foreign nations, not the executive. Although the executive has a robust foreign affairs power, that does not include the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations. And so given the executive's um, uh, advances in, in pursuing a robust trade policy in the last administration, as well as in the present Biden administration, members of Congress have become increasingly uneasy about just how much latitude the executive branch has taken. So we have a sort of a simmering discontent that has been pervasive in the DC environment now for several years, right? This obviously predates the discussions with Taiwan and are not related specifically to Taiwan. But that leads me then to, to say maybe uh, three categories of things. First, what's special about this Taiwan relationship and this particular deal? Second, what's not special about it? And then third, I want to come to the, the issues that, uh, that it has brought to light. So first, what's special about this U.S.-Taiwan agreement and the relationship, the ongoing negotiations? Well, number one at the top of that list is that it is Taiwan. Uh, and, and in a way that seems obvious, but it, it shouldn't go uh, without being said that uh, that the Taiwan relationship, not only from the perspective of our, our Taiwanese colleagues that you've just heard, but surely also uh, from the U.S. government's perspective, this is an important and special and unique relationship that really is unparalleled with any of our, of our other colleagues. And, and that just puts it in a plane of its own. So despite all the concerns we might have about the Constitution in the United States, and despite this simmering discontent between the executive and, and the legislature, Taiwan is special and Taiwan will be treated specially. And we've, we've seen that already, and it has been that way for, for some time. 
A second thing that's sort of special about this agreement is, is in a way, the timing. Um, that is, if we had had this conversation and entered into these negotiations uh, 10 years ago, it would not have been um, the same sort of um, perhaps feelings or attention is a better way of putting it, attention to this agreement that we particularly saw here. Uh, and, and, and I'll say sort of why that matters in, in a moment, but around this, you hear many other colleagues talk, calling for an FTA saying, because Taiwan is special, we don't need to worry about the usual constraints. We could just go for the FTA. And because we have bipartisan support in Congress, because everybody loves and wants to support the Taiwanese relationship, then, then this, this is a special moment in which we can actually move this into an FTA discussion. And so that remains to be sort of a special bit that you don't hear about our other trading relationships. You don't hear folks saying that about, for example, the IPEF or the America's partnership or, or others. And the third thing that's special is, is, again, embedded in the other two things related to how Taiwan is special, is, is Congress's response to this particular agreement, uh, which, again, I'll come back to the legislation that has already been mentioned, where Congress says expressly in the legislation, it is the sense of Congress that the United States should continue to deepen its relationship with Taiwan. There in black and white, you hear the, 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 the how Taiwan remains special in this, in this uh, economic uh, conversation. Now, what's not special? What's not special about this is that the provisions of this agreement uh, are, are not new. We, we hear that maybe in the next uh, round of agreements, uh, there, there will be uh, sort of cutting edge new, new language. But in this particular one, it looks a lot like some of our other um, trade facilitation type protocols that we've had with our South American partners. Uh, it looks not too dissimilar from some of what has been negotiated right, at the WTO. Uh, so there are other agreements like this one, which I think also has sort of smoothed the way for its acceptance uh, in the US in the US government beyond the negotiating team. The second thing that's not special um, is that we have many agreements with Taiwan already. Right? We already have about 30 um, what we call trade executive agreements, agreements that are trade related, that are in force, that are not uh, approved by Congress, maybe were originally authorized by Congress, but did not receive congressional approval. So this is not unusual to see an agreement come to the fore with Taiwan uh, that has not gone through the full congressional vetting process. So in that sense, not special in the, among other Taiwanese US agreements. Okay, but regardless of the special and non-special nature of, of the agreement, these, there still remain some, some issues um, that I just want to say a little bit more about uh, in, in this congressional executive relationship. Again, some of them we have highlighted already, but the fact that Congress never authorized the executive to enter into such a, an agreement uh, really was, uh, nor at the time of its signing had they had also not authorized it to enter into force, really was 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 bringing uh, up uh, this this simmering discontent uh, to to the headlines, so to speak, and, and and saying to Congress, the moment is now for you to say whether this could go forward or not. And in a way, it was it was. Um, a kind of surprising, uh, I think, that the, the Congress came back with this legislation, right? that sort of a surprise legislation comes forward and says, we're going to, to approve the deal. Great. Uh, that part, not a surprise. But we're going to use this deal as the vehicle through which we're going to reassert our congressional authority on trade. And that, I think, is what has received the most attention, again, because no one is surprised so much that we want to be close with Taiwan and our economic relationship, but more that Congress would use this act to say, we are, we are present, we are here, we, we as the members of Congress uh, do not want the executive to have a, a blank check, blank authority to, to move ahead with any such agreement. So what does the act do, this U.S.-Taiwan initiative on 21st century uh, uh, first uh, agreement uh, implementation act. It's, it's a mouthful. Uh, what does it do? It, it allows uh, the the president to to again to enter into force for the agreement to enter into force for the president to to make certain certifications that would allow the agreement to enter into force. And we'll wait for an update on on where that stands. But it also says that it cannot take effect unless Congress does certain things, has the opportunity to approve, review for future agreements, this is the way it will proceed. So it would be interesting to hear um, how 
uh, Taiwan uh, has now that the government of Taiwan has uh, received these these um, instructions, so to speak, that uh, these are instructions from Congress to the president, but which absolutely have an impact on the negotiations because members of of, uh, of Congress or their designees will be now accredited members of the U.S. delegation in these future negotiations. So now Congress is present at the negotiating table, so to speak, in a way that it was not previously. We know that the act provides that the, any further agreement may not take effect unless Congress enacts legislation expressly approving it, that it must be provided, the text must be provided with briefings to, the certain, to certain congressional committees on certain timelines, time for those committees to review any negotiating text, and in fact, to, to extend the timeline that they have to review. So, so these are um, some of what we call sort of TPA-like uh, in the sense that they're trade promotion authority-like uh, authorities. They, they are giving the president, giving the USTR the power to negotiate, but saying, they're under our rules and our timeline that Congress will set. Okay, this came again somewhat as a surprise that Congress would would assert so much authority over this particular negotiating uh, exercise, given the support we have, the bipartisan support we have for Taiwan, not to diminish the importance that it said, yes, we approve the agreement you've already done, and you, you have the ability to implement it, that for sure, there's support there, but it also complicates somewhat the ongoing negotiating process. Now, interestingly, just as, a, as an aside, an important aside, uh, when President Biden signed this act um, into, into law, when he signed it, he issued a statement that said that some of the act's requirements uh, would raise constitutional concerns. Um, now, we can get into that if folks are particularly interested in those, uh, but uh, there, is a, there is a question as to whether the act um, may have gone too far, uh, debatable in, in some respects. The, the president claims it, it impermissibly infringed on his uh, authority to negotiate with a foreign partner on the one hand, and also that allowing certain members of Congress to increase the waiting period before negotiating texts could be shared with Taiwan, whether that violated a uh, different uh, Supreme Court doctrine uh, with respect to the congressional executive relationship. So, so some, again, that, that simmering tension remains the discontent between the two branches, trying to sort out what really is the separation of trade law powers in the United States. Ordinarily, this would be the stuff for trade law professors to sit around and talk about over tea <laughs> and wouldn't bother most people. But in this instance, it has a direct impact on the negotiations, future negotiations <laughs> with Taiwan, which is why I go into them in, in a bit of detail. Uh, very last thing I'll say on this, and, and, and then one word on international issues, is that the, the act also provides that this first agreement does not constitute a free trade agreement, uh, of course, not in the traditional sense that we mean it, but for purposes of the Inflation Reduction Act tax credits on electric vehicles. So if you're interested and you're following those critical minerals agreements, you will make note of this provision saying that this does not constitute such an agreement, not a critical minerals <laughs> agreement or a free trade agreement, uh, which again matters mostly for the nerds in Washington, but with an economic impact uh, of importance. Very briefly, because Ambassador Lowe mentioned the RTA committee. So on the international issue side, not many to speak of. I, I agree to the extent Ambassador Lowe was saying that this is um, does not raise Article 24 gap concerns in terms of whether this is a, creating a free trade area. We're, we're not in that space, uh, although it's an interesting uh, both academic and important legal question as to whether uh, where that, that line is triggered, where we do look to Article 24, a conversation for, for another day. But I do think it would be helpful to raise these sorts of agreements in the RTA's committee or for the WTO to have another role, given how prominent these sorts of, in our case, trade executive agreements, but you could call them non-FTA trade-related agreements we have throughout the world, that it would be uh, useful and relevant uh, for WTO members uh, to, to engage about them uh, in Geneva. So that's one thing I would say, although I, again, don't see any uh, any legal concerns with doing so. And, and secondly, the, the other international issue, Minister Deng mentioned that this could be a template for Taiwan in many respects, but then also for the United States, I think there is an impact beyond Taiwan. There's, there's firstly, of course, what Congress is doing, but we've talked about that. But secondly, with respect to the, the content, 
and future agreements that the United States may enter into. Uh, as, I, as I highlighted earlier, uh, they are talking about uh, an environmental provision that would be the first of its kind that surely would be relevant in other places. And it's that type of thing that we may see taken from the Taiwan conversation that would become the, the standard uh, language or the, the, the new foundation in other, in other negotiations with our other trading partners. With that, Peter, let me hand it back to you. Thank you again for hosting this conversation. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you for pointing out what is, uh, what is new and what is not new, and also pointing out the challenges that are still ahead, uh, even for uh, the agreement that we're currently looking at, and not only for the, the ongoing negotiations. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Jeffrey, floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Peter, and uh, thank you, Minister Deng, Ambassador Lowe, and, and uh, Professor Clausen. Those were three excellent presentations, uh, full of meat, red meat, uh, some somewhat, a little bit of white meat uh, pork, but uh, uh, very, very valuable. And I know we're 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 uh, pressed for time. So let me just add a few economic points to complement uh, those three presentations. Uh, and I do so having looked at this issue for a long time. Uh, uh, the author of the Taiwan Relations Act uh, was a, a man of, of great uh, uh, esteem in the United States Congress who came from my hometown, uh, Lester Wolf. And so uh, I recall discussing this with him even in his late 90s uh, and uh, how proud he was to help uh, support and, and start building the bridges between our two countries. And the work that you're doing, Minister Deng, uh, really uh, strengthens and reinforces th those, that initial construct. So thank you for, for all your efforts for so many years. Now. It's been 50 years since I started negotiating trade agreements. Uh, and uh, let me just add one point that uh, trade negotiators know, it's a dirty little secret of trade negotiators, uh, that uh, the, uh, about trade negotiations. And that is your country's largest gains from trade negotiations usually come from changes in your own policies. And if you look at what Taiwan has been doing, uh, particularly uh, with the United States, uh, it hasn't changed US policy, uh, but it has led to some very important uh, improvements in the operations of the Taiwanese economy for the benefit of Taiwan's people. Uh, Taiwan is doing well for itself by negotiating trade deals when it can and aligning its domestic policies to the requirements of prospective deals like the CPTPP and the US FTA template as established in the US-Mexico-Canada agreement. Uh, this is, uh, if you look at the uh, agreement that, uh, that you negotiated, uh, Minister Deng, uh, a lot of it follows very closely uh, the provisions of the USMCA. Uh, and so from a U.S. point of view, almost state of the art and building and improving on that state of the art, as you said. Uh, it's, uh, but trade agreements are also important for another reason. Uh, uh, and it's a point that Minister Deng mentioned right at the start of his presentation, investment. Uh, trade packs are valuable because they lock in reforms uh, in both countries. Uh, and that provides greater certainty or greater stability in the business environment. You know what the rules of the game are. Uh, they are reversible, but it's much harder to do so politically. Uh, and that reduced uncertainty uh, encourages new investment from domestic and foreign sources. Uh, and so the, the PACs that uh, Taiwan reaches with the United States, the investment pact with Canada, the enhanced uh, agreement with the UK, 
all of these are reinforcing uh, the uh, ability of the uh, Taiwan and encouraging uh, investment from all over the world. It's a very uh, factor. Now, U.S. executive agreements are not secured by uh, congressional action. Uh, our, our, our actually changed U.S. law in the agreement, uh, which it did not do, as I understand it, but Kathleen can, can, uh, can correct me. Which it did not do in HR four zero zero four. So the, there there is the benefit that Congress blessed the agreement, uh, and, and provisions that I I think can be helpful for future agreements by the additional criteria that Congress added to the negotiating process. That's that the administration. Con Constitutional issues is uh, uh, essentially there. There is the concern uh, could uh, rip up the deal, or change it, or ignore it, or lots of other terribles. Um, that's the third point I wanted to raise. Uh, that is, is not unlikely. Uh, pardon my double negative, uh, that uh, there is a risk starting next year that Taiwan could get sideswiped by uh, a U.S. rollback or a, a protectionist impulses uh, that arise, that could arise under both uh, e either uh, uh, a reelected President Biden or, uh, or, or a newly uh, elected President Trump. And these arise from a, uh, a number of, of uh, concerns, political concerns and economic. Um, they will be in addition to the continued extraterritorial uh, application of U.S. export controls on high technology products. But I think there's a means of managing uh, uh, that, that that you you've worked out with your counterparts in Washington. Uh, but there is a risk uh, because of U.S. tax policy, and this is an issue that isn't widely understood, uh, uh, certainly abroad. Uh, next year, uh, the very overly generous and expensive tax cuts that were passed in the Trump administration will expire. Uh, but many members of Congress will not want them to be expire. Uh, but the full extension of them will will be uh, financially very difficult. Uh, so there will be a fight over what to cut, what to extend, and where to find additional revenue. And one source of additional revenue will be from foreigners, uh, either in the form of additional tariffs, and uh, Donald Trump has already said that he's going to put across the board tariffs on friend and foe alike. Uh, uh, but the other will be from carbon border adjustment measures. Uh, and there's a number of bills that are in Congress now that probably won't be acted on this year uh, because very little will be acted on this year in Congress, uh, but will be in the forefront starting next year uh, for either environmental reasons or for fiscal reasons and protectionist reasons. And so this is something that uh, needs to be uh, on, on your horizon as, uh, as you continue to plan uh, 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 your future negotiations. So that uh, I think are, is, is, uh, are the important points that, that deserve attention. Uh, uh, Kathleen mentioned the, the issues on agriculture and, and labor that uh, have, have importance. Uh, that will 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 be difficult, uh, but 
uh, there was also mention of the environmental uh, uh, provisions. And there, I think, is a great opportunity. And this is my last comment. And that that is work can be done akin to pillar three of the I, IPAF to build new climate uh, climate specific projects and, and initiatives uh, that could be helpful in uh, uh, arresting or, or deflecting uh, the protectionist pressures on, on a climate border adjustment measure if, if uh, Taiwan is working closely with the United States and other countries in the Asia Pacific on this. So this is something that probably has not received enough attention to date, but it is a great opportunity and a new and another area where the United States and Taiwan can further strengthen their economic and political relationship. Thank you. And thank you. Um, thank you for bringing to the to the table even more um, things to watch out for um, in the um, weeks, months, and years to come. Um, <laughs> Time flies, and time flies even faster when one has a great when one has a great conversation. Um, we have only fifteen minutes left, um, and um, we have a, a very large audience, online audience. Uh, for the moment, only one question. Um, I will come to that question, and hopefully, some more um, after giving. Um, Minister Deng, at least, uh, the opportunity to um, respond to some of the comments that were made by the other panelists. Um, and um, and then we'll see uh, what we do with the questions. Um, Mr. Deng. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Law and uh, Professor uh, Clausen and uh, Jeffrey. Uh, your advice, I, I, I took uh, note on uh, all those major points that, uh, thank you very much for the advice. Uh, Jeffrey alert uh, something uh, to us, which we probably uh, uh, was not uh, that clear. Uh, thank you very much uh, for those advices on the uh, environmental protection. Uh, and uh, uh, your comments on the uh, uh, agreement to in reinforce the uh, our uh, ability to uh, attract uh, on investment. And uh, one thing I was uh, smiling to myself that uh, Jeffrey's comment uh, that those trade agreements are really helping us to do something good for, for ourselves. Uh, this intellectual property rights protection is a very uh, typical case. Well, uh, uh, 20, 30 years ago that uh, we, uh, uh, our society and the many of our newspaper media comments that uh, uh, United States came with a big hammer to uh, hammer Taiwan to protect the intellectual property rights uh, so that we have to pay more royalty to US companies. Uh, we were not very happy with it. Uh, uh, now, uh, after 20 years of, of those uh, negotiation and uh, uh, the uh, constantly watch from the US government, Taiwan is the best example for the uh, intellectual property protection. And we ask many investors, why do they choose Taiwan? And uh, number one reason, always say you protect intellectual property rights. So. Uh, your comments, perfect. I agree with you <laughs> entirely. Oh, Professor uh, uh, Carlson, uh, to answer your question, what is, how, how far we've been uh, going on on this verification uh, process that uh, uh, the act requires. Uh, you, you, you are a veteran uh, USTR uh, lawyer. Uh, I, uh, I always respect USTR lawyers. Uh, they are so good. They are so professional. They are so detailed. They won't miss any uh, 
they, they, they don't want to miss any, uh, any points. So they were asking uh, Taiwan to provide so many informations. And uh, we have uh, most of our regulations or executive order were already translated into English. However, because of this agreement, we have to publish, issue more executive orders. Uh, we have to amend uh, some regulations uh, that need translation into English. Uh, this translation is not a, a Dickinson novel translation. This is a lawyer, this is a legal document translation. Uh, we, uh, we have to uh, uh, find uh, uh, different translators, lawyers to do that job. So it took time for us to provide information to USTR. And the USTR, our understanding is this is the first time for USTR lawyers to write that kind of report to Congress. So this is also a new test for them. Uh, I, uh, it is a, sometimes you feel a very time consuming process, but we are happy to be the pioneer uh, for that process. I expect this, uh, uh, I, what I can, uh, my colleagues told me, my lawyers told me that the process went well, there's no difficulty. However, it takes time. Uh, to ask questions for those who wants to ask questions for all us uh, who needs to answer the questions, all the regulations, all executive orders, all the obligations, uh, we are pretty sure that uh, we can meet, we can satisfy Congress standard. Uh, it just take time. Uh, and of course the whole society is expecting it's effective. Uh, this is a such, a big thing to Taiwan. So uh, it is approved, but we are waiting for it. It's effective. So we know uh, it is a big burden for us uh, to finish that process. I don't expect, I met with uh, Ambassador uh, Tai uh, uh, in uh, Abu Dhabi also, and, uh, and uh, her lawyers, your colleagues. Uh, and uh, uh, I think I, I'm quite comfortable that we should be able to, to finish that soon. Uh, as to the uh, effect for the future, yes, it looks like it looks like it is a testing. It is a new thing that you have to give uh, Congress certain period of time, certain days. Uh, I I don't know how. Uh, our USTR colleagues, your former colleagues, how to uh, how to they adjust their working procedure. I'm pretty sure my legislators in our parliament will ask for the same thing. So, <laughs> so we we are we also study very carefully what uh, what uh, we can we may expect from our uh, legislators. It is also new uh, to us. So, but uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think I learned a lot from uh, uh, the comments from, uh, uh, I, of course, with uh, Ambassador Law, we talk to uh, each other all the time, but uh, for Professor uh, Clausen and uh, Jeffrey, thank you very much for the comment. I hope we can see each other and we have more time uh, to discuss those issues further. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Like Thank you push. very much, Minister Deng. Um, with the permission of, um, I, I will give everybody the, the, the opportunity to make a final, final statement, but uh, with your permission, rather than have the round of discussions uh, among you, for which unfortunately we will not have sufficient time, um, let's perhaps go to the, um, the question. Um, and I hope that uh, you can all see that question um, in the um, question and answer session. Um, the question comes from um, a good friend, former colleague, um, and now the moderator of um, the um, International Economic Law and Policy Blog, um, Simon Lester. 
Um, and Simon Lester, and now part of his Christian disappears from my screen, um, but um, Simon Lester asks or, or makes first the observation that the, the Biden administration is not very interested in any trade deal um, that provides for uh, tariff reductions. And uh, the, the, the current uh, agreement that we were looking at uh, does not provide for that. But, but then he goes on and say, would Taiwan be willing um, uh, to negotiate with the U.S. an agreement that would uh, focus on some of the Biden administration's um, uh, preferences. Um, and he, he refers in particular um, to the rapid response labor mechanism uh, that uh, we do find in the USMCA. Um, as, as was mentioned, uh, the current negotiations also involve trade and labor. Um, so this may be something that, uh, that is the question by Simon Lester. Minister Deng, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lester, uh, for your question. Uh, to, uh, to, to give a very quick response to your question. Uh, yes, uh, we, uh, we understand that the US is not interested in uh, talking about tariff concession. Although we hope very much we can deal with it, uh, but we know that uh, we also understand uh, U.S. political uh, uh, climate. Now, uh, are we going uh, agreeing to follow U.S. priorities? We agreed to discuss labor issue. We discuss. We agree uh, to discuss uh, 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 good governance, uh, regulatory governance. Uh, yes. Uh, so we already agree uh, to talk to United States on labor. Uh, your question, particularly, is in the rapid uh, response labor uh, mechanism. Uh, we analyzed USMCA's quick response uh, me uh, labor mechanism. Uh, we think this is two different Mexico and Taiwan are two different systems. Uh, our labor, uh, in our case, in our case, we have serious shortage of labor. We have to protect our labor. We have it's long term, and Taiwan's um, NGO is very very active. Uh, if uh, our thinking is, we can always discuss anything that both party, either party, wants to raise. We can always discuss that including this rapid uh, mechanism. However, there's no need to copy the exact process procedure from USMCA applied to Taiwan. Uh, we have fair, open, transparent uh, labor dispute mechanism. Uh, as I think your labor organization, uh, they have uh, many uh, exchange with our uh, labor uh, ministries. So uh, we can discuss that. We can go along with, uh, 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 work along with uh, US priorities, but we don't think uh, two, so two systems are the same. There's no need to exactly copy uh, US uh, system with Mexico uh, to Taiwan. Uh, in USMCA, if our understanding is correct, uh, you do not have this refugee system with Canada. Since Canada is a system where uh, US uh, understands better or uh, Canada, uh, in Canada, in US assessment that they can handle uh, their dispute. And they are under their own system. We think we are more like uh, Canada uh, standards, uh, but however, we, are, we, we, we can discuss that uh, with the United States. Uh, Minister Deng, I see that there is uh, yet another question um, in the chat. Um, uh, the question is um, following up, but it's a question for Kathleen um, and for uh, you, Minister. Um, is there a chance for Taiwan and the US to sign 
um, uh, a U.S. Um, um, a U.S. Taiwan um, digital trade agreement, um, similar to the type that uh, the U.S. has with Japan. Um, is there any chance of that? Can we ask Professor Clausen to answer first? We are ready. Uh, so it is. Uh, we don't know uh, how U.S. Uh, is prepared to deal with it. <laughs> Kathleen. Thank you. And, and maybe I can say a word also in response to Simon's question, if you'll permit me, Peter, very, very briefly as time is, is, is fleeting. Um, just uh, uh, so I have many, many reactions to Minister Deng's response that I will hold for another day. But I, I just that, um, you know, what we have seen, of course, in IPEF is, is a rapid response mechanism uh, of a different sort, so to speak. It doesn't use that rapid response language. It's a facility specific labor rights and consistencies mechanism. And that's the type of thing that that we might see. Not e not even speaking of Taiwan at the moment, but but that other trading partners may be more amenable to that uh, under this new sort of corporate accountability approach that USTR has taken. So. That's somewhat agreeing with Minister Deng that Mexico is a special case, but then also saying that maybe there's space, uh, not specifically necessarily with Taiwan, but within our other negotiations to see something of that of that sort. But more on that for another day. And on the question of the digital agreement, I mean, I think to the extent the question is 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 directed to me um, with respect to our domestic issues, I can certainly say that I think we've seen from the the act, the Taiwan Act, um, that was has now um, U.S. law, um, that Congress has laid the foundation to be supportive of such a deal. And since Minister Deng reported earlier in our conversation that the maybe third uh, third round of negotiations, the, the the third deal under the framework, could deal with digital trade, I think we're in a good space now as a matter of US law for that to be received and, and to be implemented. Um, uh, uh, Professor Vanden uh, Bush, uh, one word. Uh, we will talk with UK on digital agreement under that uh, enhanced trade partnership. So Taiwan is ready to talk to any countries uh, with the, uh, uh, on digital uh, issues. We also inform that to our USTR colleagues that uh, if you are prepared, we are prepared. And as a matter of fact, we we already engaged with the UK on on those on the on that particular issue. Unfortunately, we've come to the end, um, and I will give uh, each of you the opportunity to make a very very short final um, statement. Um, perhaps do that in the reverse order of um, your initial contributions. So, Jeffrey, please, and then Kathleen, Shangfa, and Minister Deng. Well, first of all, uh, what we learned today is that uh, bilateral negotiations between the United States and Taiwan can can serve as negotiating laboratories uh, to help improve existing uh, WTO and regional and bilateral uh, rulemaking. And that's very important and can serve as a guide for not only our own bilateral relations, but for future development of, of rulemaking in the world trading system. And the second point is to thank you all very much for allowing me to join with you and learn so much from all of you. Thank you. Kathleen. Thank you, Peter. Just also my thanks to, to you for the invitation to WTI for hosting this important conversation. I agree wholeheartedly with what's been said that uh, there, is a, there is a special relationship between these two governments that um, continues to thrive as seen in what we've heard today, what the, the, both the legislation in the United States and the agreement has, has done so far. And I'm very much looking forward to see what happens in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I have the same deep feeling about negotiations uh, of, of for higher standards being uh, beneficial to 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 uh, to ourselves. This is this is what uh, we really uh, believe uh, about the the template uh, for Taiwan. The template for U.S. is mentioned by 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 John by Catherine and also laboratory <laughs> as a laboratory as mentioned by Jeff. Actually, uh, there, there are such a wide uh, spectrum uh, for us to, to consider. Temper for Taiwan, temper for US, temper for other countries uh, to uh, to deal with Taiwan or to deal with other uh, countries. 
about the, uh, the special and non-special, uh, probably uh, the the living uh, framework uh, been also a very special one because uh, this is uh, an incremental approach to add uh, uh, since can be uh, can be add on uh, about the uh, IFTA uh, I think this it is worthwhile uh, for, for 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 John to consider notifying uh, to the IFTA to see what uh, could happen uh, there was once a, a chance I uh, had uh, bilateral uh, discussions with the chair on, on the uh, the, the development of new type of uh, of trade agreement. I mentioned to her that uh, probably we uh, we should uh, conduct a periodic article uh, review uh, about the new type of of, uh, of arrangement. This is one of the new types of arrangement uh, that uh, members would like to to see with interest. Thank you, <laughs> Minister Deng. The last word is for you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I think I want to uh, thank uh, uh, WTI for, for this for this event uh, and also uh, uh, the discuss discussion today. Uh, my my last my one of the point I I think a very important message we would like to convey to you and uh, to uh, our colleagues and uh, your audience today is that uh, Taiwan always appreciate the support friendship. Of the international community, the uh, uh, on the stability of Taiwan Strait, and on the security of Taiwan, we always appreciate that, and we appreciate all the assistance, the help uh, given uh, to Taiwan on WHO, on everything, on international activities. Uh, I want uh, to say. The uh, one of the most important uh, factor for Taiwan to be able to continue to support to maintain our system, our democracy, is the strength of economy. And uh, to be able to sign agreement like the United States with Taiwan is an assistance, uh, a very substantial help, a real help. We appreciate United States. Uh, we appreciate US administration. We appreciate US Congress. We appreciate uh, scholars, think tanks from the United States because we need uh, this kind of uh, uh, very concrete, very substantial uh, uh, show of support to us uh, so that Taiwan can continue to uh, uh, to have a uh, strong economy so that we can defend uh, ourselves. So with that, uh, I want to uh, thank you all uh, for tonight's uh, discussion. Thank you. Well, and with that, we have uh, come to the end of uh, this webinar. I would like to thank very, very much uh, Minister Deng, Kathleen, Jeffrey, and Shang Fa um, for this interesting very interesting informative and and, and thought-provoking uh discussion uh, what i've learned from this um is that uh, the us taiwan trade relations are very much a topic which deserves our attention uh in the coming years thank you very much with this we close